بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما uh, Dear students, thank you very much for uh, plugging in, hooking up in these lectures uh, We have completed now unit 2 uh, by finishing viruses and today we are starting a new chapter or a new unit about the cell and the organelles within the cell So what we're going to be doing is to zoom into inside the cell world and understand the different organelles, learn about the different organelles that are found inside the cell, what are their functions, and how do they collectively do their job and make the cell functional and alive. So today's lecture is going to be Cellular Organelles 1, which is going to have a continuation, inshallah, in the next, next lecture, uh, where we kind of take you inside a tour inside the cell to learn about the different organelles. The objectives and the outcomes are, of the lecture are is to differentiate between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, which you already kind of know from chapter one and two, but we're going to elaborate a little bit more or maybe just refresh your memory. Uh, we are also going to determine the importance of the surface area to volume ratio and limiting the size, the size of the cell. Why is it important to have a limit on the size of the cell? Why can't our cells be very, very, very big? are very, very, very small. Why is there a limit, an upper limit and a lower limit uh, for the cells? And the answer to that is, re is related to the function of the cell. And we'll use, inshallah, a few slides to highlight the importance of having a limit to the size of the cell. We're also going to describe the concept or the term compartmentalization. I know this is kind of a long word for you guys, but you, what you can do is you can split the word. It comes from the word compartment. Uh, compartment means to, to have uh, like sections or groups. So if you have something like this in the cell, then you have compartments. Okay, these are different compartments that have different organelles. Okay, so compartmentalization of the cell. Why do we have compartmentalization of eukaryotic cells? Uh, in, in prokaryotes, we don't have compartmentalization. Everything is just swimming inside the cytoplasm. Mafi have compartments, mafi have garaf. Um, we're also going to describe the structure and function of ribosomes, which already we covered in translation. Uh, we're going to define endomembrane system. What is the endomembrane system? What are the components of the endomembrane system? And then we're going to talk about, uh, in this lecture, two of these endomembrane systems, which is the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the next lecture, we're going to continue uh, the other organelles in the endomembrane system. Let's start by refreshing your memory. What are the similarities between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells? What is uh, um, the things that are in common between them? Well, both prokaryotes and eukaryotes are enclosed by a similar membrane. They both have plasma membranes. They both contain DNA. They both have ribosomes because they all need proteins. So the ribosomes are found in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Uh, remember that ribosomes are not membrane bound organelles. They're just organelles that are not surrounded by a membrane. And that's why you find them in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And they both have similar metabolic pathways. And of course, the size. Eukaryotic cells are larger than prokaryotic cells. So sorry, these were the, these were the things that are similar, which is shibah, okay, between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And let's look at the differences. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. Eukaryotes have a nucleus with a clear nuclear envelope. Prokaryotes don't have membranous organelles. So they don't have organelles that are surrounded by membranes. Whereas the eukaryotes have membranous organelles. So the organelles that are found inside the eukaryotes are surrounded, uh, many of them surrounded by membrane. Um, the DNA is not separated uh, from the cytoplasm and for prokaryotes, they're swimming together. But in eukaryotes, the DNA is enclosed in a nucleus with a nuclear envelope. In prokaryotes, almost all have cell walls, but in eukaryotes, only some uh, eukaryotes have cell walls like plants. And then here's another difference. We said the size. So the eukaryotes are larger than prokaryotic cell. So this slide is nice in summarizing the differences and similarities between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now, that was the first objective or the first outcome of today's lecture. The second one is to understand the importance of the cell size. Why do we have a limit on the cell size? Now, these are bacteria, insects and bugs, 
and mammals. We obviously all know that um, bacteria are smaller than insects and bugs and insects and bugs are smaller than mammals. Uh, but however, the size of the cell is not very, very different. So it's not like the whales or dinosaurs have huge cells and the bacteria have tiny cells. There is a limit on the cell size and we're going to understand why. The difference is in the number of cells, not the size. So it's the number of cells, not the size of the cell. Okay, so the size of the cell is not very different. There's a limit. The eukaryotic cells are 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 bigger than the eukaryotic. Uh, the eukaryotic uh, cells are bigger than the prokaryotic cells, but they're not much much larger. So it's not like the whales are made up of one large cell. Yeah, they have millions of cells. Here, bacteria is single cell. Okay, the difference is in the number. So larger organisms have a larger number of cells, but we have an upper limit to the cell. Fiha, fiha range, there's a range for the cell size. It can't exceed a specific size. Let's see why and let's understand how. So let's look at this. The surface area to volume ratio. Let's look at this, this scenario over here. Here you have a single cell organism made up of just one cell. And here you have a multicellular organism. So you have an organism with so many cells and each cell is the same size of the single cell one over here. So in real life, this is not what we have. And it's not like as the organisms uh, grow bigger, then we have bigger cells. La. Okay, have the scenario mamojud. Okay, so when the organisms, when you have bigger organisms, it just means that you have a larger number, sorry, a larger number of cells. Al-adad yazid, al hajam. Now, why is that important? Okay, again, I'm going to repeat this. Prokaryotic cells are made up of single cells, okay? And as the cells, uh, as, as the organisms become larger, like whales and dinosaurs and humans, it's not like the actual cell size becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. It just means that the number of cells becomes more and more and more in these organisms. And that is very, very important. And we're gonna see why that's very important. Let's see together why that is important. All right. Okay, let's take each scenario one by one. Let's look at this one. Now, we're, what we're going to do is our aim from this slide is to calculate the ratio of surface area to volume. And this book, okay, and the volume, the volume. And we're going to see why it's important to have these smaller, uh, increasing the number of cells rather than increasing the size of the cells. Let's look at one by one. Here, to calculate the surface area, I'll the equation, height by width, by number of sides, and by the number of boxes. So let's calculate the surface area of each scenario. Scenario A, and then height one, multiplied by the width, which is one, multiplied by the number of sides, it has six sides, طبعاً, the square, multiplied by the number of boxes, and then one box, so 1 times 1 times 6 times 1 is equal to 6. So the surface area of this box is 6. Okay. Now let's do the same thing with the rest of scenarios. Here you have the height in the second in scenario B now. The height is كم? 5. So you have 5. Excuse my handwriting. All right. Multiplied by the width. Okay, العرض, five by multiplied by the number of sides. كم وجه كم سايد عندنا? Six multiplied. Oops, multiplied by the number of boxes, which is one. So we have uh, twenty-five. Uh, twenty-five multiplied by six, and that is a hundred and fifty. Okay, beautiful. Now we're going to go to the next. To the next one. أو شيء قبل ما نروح للنكس one. Look at this. The difference in surface area. أي واحد مساحة السطح ما له أعلى. Of course, this one has a higher surface area. This is 150 in scenario B, and it's only six in scenario C. Let's look at the surface area in scenario C. The height will be uh, five 
so here is very easy to do the calculation because we already know the surface area over here we already know the surface area oops i'm trying to highlight we already know the surface area of this right the surface area is six so all we have to do is multiply the surface area by the number of boxes here how many boxes do we have five times five times five me you have 125 boxes and each box is surface area amalu kam each box surface area amalu sitta so 125 multiplied by 6 equals 750 and that's how we calculate the surface area for each one and you can see that the surface area of scenario C is much much higher مساحة السطح للسيناريو مال سي واجد أعلى لأنه عنده أكثر من أوجه أوجه كثيرة أكثر من بي و أي so it has a higher surface area let's look at the volume now I'm not going to get into the details you can do this very simple calculations by yourself I'm not going to write it down so let's look at the volume the volume is height by width by length by number of boxes so here it's one by one by one by one and the volume is one here if you do the calculations um, but sorry. 5 times 5 times 5 times 1 uh, will give you 125 and here it's going to be 125 because it's the uh, the total volume here multiplied by the number of boxes we already agreed that the number of boxes in this is 125 so 125 in 1 is 125 then the volume you will notice is not different between these two the volume here is equal to the volume here, the total volume, okay? But the surface area here is less than the surface area here. So if we come to the end and calculate what we're looking for, which is the surface to volume ratio in Nisma with Tanasub Alan, Afun, all right, so we'll see that um that we're going to now do the 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 uh, the, uh, the um, ratio okay and we divide 150 by 120 uh, sorry 150 divided by 125 that will give you 1.2 and if we want to calculate the uh, surface area of scenario c that is 750 divided by 125 it gives us six and if we want to do the surface area of scenario A, then we divide uh, 6 divided by 1, which is equal to 6. So notice that the surface to volume ratio is the same in scenario A, scenario A, and scenario C. Look at this. And the surface area is less. And we don't want the surface area to be less. عشان كده في الطبيعة يا عندنا unicellular organisms like this, all right? Or we have multicellular organisms that look like this. We don't have multicellular organisms that look like this because the cell size doesn't go bigger and bigger and bigger. It's the number of cells that increase. وحين عرفنا هميتا ليش نحن نريد نحافظ على مساحة السطح بالنسبة للحجم, all right? So here this is six, and here this is six. If if in reality, if in reality, the size of the cell becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, not the number, then the surface area will be less. And we don't want the surface area to be less. Why? That is my question to you. Why? Why is it so important to have a large surface area? Think about the... Com when I ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen, I want to, you to ask yourself an opposing question. So if I say... Why is it important to have a large surface area to volume? And then you come and say, let me ask myself this question. Okay, what is the function of the cell? What does the cell do to survive? What does it need? And I'm sure you remember from chapter 2 and chapter 1, it exchanges material. So in order to exchange material, to bring in the nutrients and gases and exchange gases and remove out waste, you need to exchange, right? So then you need to have a large or a higher surface area in order to make to make that um, to in order to make that uh, exchange of material 
uh, feasible and smooth. All right, if you wanted more details on this, please go to figure 7.5 on page 113. It will give you more clarity when you read, you read it from the book as well. I hope that was clear. It's very simple calculations. Okay, very, very simple. And it's, it's clearly explained here. All right, um, everything that has life is made up of cells. Cells define life and cells are the smallest unit of life that uh, exists. Anything uh, smaller than the cells are not considered uh, live. Okay, uh, the cells are smallest life units on Earth and they are self uh, sustaining animal cells can divide and form new cells within 24 hours. Um, but my question here is that are they any non living objects on Earth that are also made up of cells? The answer is yes. If we look at the bark of a tree that is that is dead, any dead cell plants, okay, that's wood. So wood really is not a living thing, but it is made of dead cells in principle. Okay, so some cells that used to be once living uh, but are no longer there, like leather, hair, all right? These are all non-living, but they're actually made from cells that were once um, living, living cells. That was just a fun fact. You don't have to worry too much about it. It's just to have some uh, smile, put some smiles on your faces. Okay, let's talk about the organelles now. What are organs? Are any organelles? We said chapter three is all about organelles and the different kinds of organelles we have in the cell and the function of these organelles. What are organelles? Define organelles. They are structures that partition the cell into compartments, hujurat. Okay? Some are membranous, so some of these organelles have membranes surrounding them. Some of them are non-membranous. An example of non-membranous organelles is ribosomes. Ribosomes are organelles, yes, but they are not membranous. The ribosomes do not have a membrane surrounding them, and that is why they are found in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. However, the nucleus is a membranous organelle. So it's an organelle that is surrounded by a membrane. And that's why we find it only in eukaryotes and not in prokaryotes. Um, membrane is made of, and we know that membranes are made up of phospholipids with attached proteins. Uh, we're going to talk about that in details as well later on. And the types of these proteins determine the function of the organelle. For example, enzymes are embedded in the mitochondria. So in the mitochondria, okay, in the mitochondria, which is responsible for, for uh, releasing energy in the cell, they have lots of enzymes in them. And their function is cellular respiration. So it combusts glucose or converts glucose in the presence of oxygen into energy. That's an organelle. Let's look at the animal cells. You remember this from previous lectures. Remember in unit two or chapter two, we showed you animal cells and we showed you plant cells when we were talking about the kingdoms. When we spoke about the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom, we showed you these uh, pictures and we said, don't worry, we will cover it in details in chapter three. So who, here we are keeping our promise, talking a little bit more details about the plant and animal cell. So this is an animal cell, and I think it's so obvious. It's very clear that this is an animal cell. كيف أنا عرفت في لحظة إنه هذا animal cell? يلا, tell me. How would you? How did you know? How can you know? Even if I don't label it, حتى لو أنا شلت اللابل, كيف تعرفوا إذا هذا animal cell ولا plant cell? شكرا ما أسمع إجاباتكم بس يعني أعطيكم فرصة تجاوبوا. Okay. So the animal cells lack a cell wall. There's no cell wall here surrounding it. صح? That's number one. Number two. Look at this. You have this flagella. The flagellum is used for movement. This is not found in, uh, in a plant cell. And you have other uh, differences as well. This part over here is very important because it shows you the differences that are not found. Um, so what do you not find in animal cells? There is no chloroplast. There's no chloroplast because it doesn't perform photosynthesis. Okay, so there's no chloroplast. There's no central vacuole, which I will explain in the next slide. There's no cell wall. Okay. Why? Because in order for protection, it can just swim, swim away. And there's no plasmodesmata, which are used for communication between plant cells. But what animal cells do have, they have a nucleus. They have an endoplasmic reticulum, both smooth and rough. They have a flagellum used for movement. It has a centrosome used for uh, cell division. It has a peroxisome. It has microvilli. They have a cytoskeleton that holds all organelles together. It has a lysozyme, 
mysosome that is used to uh, for defense. It has a mitochondria, to release energy. It has a plasma membrane. It has a Golgi body, and it has ribosomes. Don't stress about all of these because guess what? In chapter three, we're going to explain each one in full detail. This is just an overall. Plant cells. Again, how do you know that this is a plant cell? على طول حتى لو أنا شلت كل labels. How would you know that this is a plant cell? Look at this. It's green. Chloroplasts, okay? Chloroplasts are used for photosynthesis, so it's super clear that this is a plant cell. Another very clear thing is the central vacuole. This huge thing over here. This is only found in plant cells, all right? And we're going to talk about this in, in the function. And I'll tell you why. And another thing that is very, very obvious is the cell wall. Look at the cell wall. Okay, so the cell wall over here, okay, it's only found in, in um, plant cells, not in animal cells. All right, so these are the main uh, things in plant and animal cells. Remember, in plant cells, we don't have lysozymes, uh, lysosomes, there's no centrioles, and it does not have a flagella. All right, dear students, so now we're going to talk about the organelles found inside the cell, and we will start with ribosomes, which you are already familiar with when we spoke about uh, translation. In the process of translation, we described the structure of the ribosome, and we gave you some details. Now we're going to give you a little bit more insights on the structure and function of ribosomes. So as you already know, uh, ribosomes are uh, made up of two parts, the large ribosomal subunit and the small ribosomal subunit, which will join together uh, during the process of translation. And uh, these ribosomes can be either found free swimming in the cytoplasm, we call them free ribosomes, and you find them swimming here in the cytoplasm. The other type uh, of ribosomes called the bound ribosomes. And the bound ribosomes, bound comes from the word binding, yeah, it's to bind or to be attached to. And these ribosomes are called bound ribosomes because they are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. So they are holding on to something. And in this case, they are holding on to the endoplasmic reticulum over here. So the ones that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, this is called endoplasmic reticulum. So if the ribosomes are attached to it, we call them bound ribosomes. And if the ribosomes are just swimming in the cytoplasm here, then we call it free ribosomes because they're swimming in the cytoplasm. Now the endoplasmic reticulum, as you can see, the location of it is right here. So it's right outside the nucleus. This is our nucleus. And right outside the nucleus, this is called endoplasmic reticulum. Now the uh, ribosomes are non-membranous organelles. So they are organelles that are not surrounded by a membrane. See, there's no membrane surrounding it. Mafi, there's no membrane, no membrane surrounding the ribosome. Okay, and they're made up of two subunits, the large ribosomal subunits and the small ribosomal subunits. And these subunits are made uh, of proteins and rRNA, as we described in, um, in the uh, lecture of translation. And the function of the ribosome is to carry out protein synthesis. So the job of ribosomes is to synthesize and make proteins. Let's talk a little bit about the job or the function uh, of the free ribosomes and the bound ribosomes. The free ribosomes, as we said, is found freely swimming in the cytosol. Uh, the cytosol is the liquid portion of the cytoplasm. Okay, so it's the liquid portion of the cytoplasm. Uh, so you, if you find the ribosome swimming suspended in the cytosol, we call them free ribosomes. And these uh, function, the, the job or the function of these ribosomes is to make proteins that function within the cytosol. So if the function of the protein is in the cytosol, then the ribosomes will be there in the cytosol. The bound ribosomes are those found attached. Where, where are they attached? The outside of the endoplasmic reticulum or the outside of the nuclear envelope. So the bound ribosomes, isma, they are attached to the outside of the ER endoplasmic reticulum or on the outside attached to the outside of the nuclear envelope so as, so as long as they are bound to the surface we call them bound ribosomes what's the function of these bound ribosomes what do they do these ribosomes are synthesizing proteins that um, 
are involved in membrane synthesis, so the proteins that are going to be in the membrane. They also make proteins that are uh, used for packaging within certain organelles like lysosomes. They also used uh, for export from the cell to make the proteins that are used to export from the cell, so secretory proteins. So these are the ribosomes and their functions. Again, a little bit more about the bound ribosomes, you'll see them here. So you can see this here is the nucleus. This over here is the endoplasmic reticulum. And these over here are ribosomes that are attached to the nuclear envelope. You see them? These are all ribosomes. Oops, apology. I'm highlighting the nuclear pores. My mistake, ladies and gentlemen. Let me do this again. In yellow, you see these small spots? These are all ribosomes. Nuclear pores. These are the pores that allow things to go between in and out uh, the nucleus. And I think I should use this figure here to highlight. Uh, it's more clear. So this over here is the nuclear pore. And the ribosomes are these ones. They look like balls. So these are ribosomes. These are bound ribosomes. Why are they bound ribosomes? Because they're attached to the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope, the nuclear lamina. All right? So the bound ribosomes, uh, cells with high rates, uh, you will find a lot of the bound ribosomes in the cells that have a high rate of protein synthesis. So you'll find a larger number of ribosomes uh, in the cells that are uh, specialized um, in protein synthesis. And these kind of cells have a prominent nucleoli. Okay, this is how the kilocam has a nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you have this. This is the nucleoli. Right there. So the cells that have high activity in protein synthesis have a very prominent nucleoli. يعني ظاهر. النucleoli عنده ظاهر. Okay, because why? Because it's very busy making a lot of ribosomes. Uh, because remember, the subunits of the ribosomes are made where they're made in the nucleoli. Okay. Now, the pancreas, for example, has a lot of secretory. Is it has secretory cells, and it has a high proportion of bound ribosomes on it. The pancreas is an example of a type of cell that has a high amount of bind ribosomes. Why? Because it needs a lot of these secretory proteins. Because it's a secretory cell. Right. Now we spoke about ribosomes. The next thing we're going to talk about is the endomembrane system. What is the endomembrane system? It is a collection of membranes inside and around the eukaryotic cell. So it includes what? Yani it's made up of so many things. I think it's a system. Manzuma. So what is it made of? It includes the nuclear envelope. It includes the endoplasmic reticulum. It includes the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles, and plasma membrane. And we're going to talk about each one. We already spoke about the nuclear envelope in the previous lecture. In the previous slide, it is the envelope surrounding the nucleus. All these membranes are related to each other through either direct physical continuity or transfer of membrane segments as vesicles. So how are these? Why is this all called endomembrane system? They're connected with each other. How? It's either direct physical continuity, it's either physically connected to each other, they're actually touching each other, or if it's not direct physical continuity, they either transfer their membrane segments through vesicles. And we'll see that in the next slide. Let's look at it over here. So this is the endomembrane system. This is the first part. We're going to start down. Let's start from the inside. This over here is a nucleus. And this part over here is a nuclear envelope, right? That surrounds the nucleus. And you can see here this blue part. This is the ER. ER is short for endoplasmic reticulum. And you can see, you look at this part over here. You can see there's a physical continuation between the nuclear envelope and the ER. They are actually physically connected to each other. So this is part of the endomembrane system, okay? And this is part of the endomembrane system. But that's not the end of the story. Even these are part of the endomembrane system. So you have transport vesicles, these are hawaisalat, transport vesicles. Their job of these, these vesicles is to carry things from the ER to the Golgi body. So this is the Golgi body here. They look like a pack of 
bread كنا خبز لبناني كذا متراصين على بعض. Okay, so this is a Golgi body over here, which is also part of the endomembrane system. And then we have vacuoles, all right? And vacuoles normally are larger than vesicles. So phys physicals or vesicles are حويصلات صغيرة. The vacuoles تكون أكبر حجمها من the vesicles. So vesicle, vacuole. Vesicle, vacuole. Vacuoles are larger. I can have food vacuoles and, and so on. And we're going to describe each one in a separate lecture. So don't worry, even if you don't fully understand it now, we have a whole lecture about vesicles and vacuoles. Okay, we also have lysozyme, lysosomes. Okay, lysosomes are structures that are used as part of the immune system to kill unwanted cells, unwanted uh, organisms inside the body. All right, so now all of this together, all of this together is called the endomembrane system. The name of the endomembrane system. Endomembrane system. It is one of the nuclear envelope, endoplasmic reticulum, and these are connected physically to each other. You have transport vesicles. You have the Golgi body. You have vacuoles. And you have lysosome. Bad baqi wahda. There's still one more thing. All right. So these are all part of the endomembrane system in addition to the plasma membrane, the outer layer, which is the plasma membrane. Okay, over here. The plasma membrane. So this all together, nuclear envelope, ER, transport vesicle, Golgi body, vacuoles, lysosome, a lysosome and plasma membrane plasma membrane, all of this together gives you an endomembrane system. Make sure you know the components of the endomembrane system. Another thing I want you to make sure that you know is that they can either be connected physically, physically like what? Like the ER and the nuclear envelope, or they can be just attached through the vesicles. So this is related to this through the vesicles, not direct contact. Same as this. When a direct contact with last skin All together, all of this together, we call it endomembrane system. Now, we, as I promised you, we're going to go from the inside to the outside. So let's start with the first thing in the endomembrane system. The first thing we're going to start with is the nucleus. We're going to learn all about the nucleus, what it is, what does it do, all the details about the nucleus. And then we go out to the ER, in the plasma reticulum, and then we're going to go to the vesicles, and then we're going to go to the Golgi body, uh, vas uh, vacuoles, uh, lysosome, and plasma membrane. We're going to talk about one by one. Okay? Let's talk about the nucleus first. Nucleuses, of course, we already know that they are found in all eukaryotic cells. It contains most of the genetic material. Why? Because some genes are located in the mitochondria and the chloroplast. We also have some genes that are found on the mitochondria and the chloroplast. But most of the genetic material is found where? In the nucleus. Now, what does it contain? The nucleus, which is very small, it's 5 micrometer in diameter, it contains a, a nuclear envelope, chromatin, nucleolus. So these three things together make the nucleus. Let's see with the picture. So the nucleus, as you can see over here, this is called the nucleus, all right? Which, if you want to see it inside the cell, that's the center, that's the nucleus over here, all right? Now, what is it made of? It's made up of a nucleolus, and that's where the ribosomal subunits are made, remember? Nucleolus. And then if you go out here, you have, you see these lines in it? These are all called, what do we call it? Chromatin. You know what's going to happen to the chromatin later? It's going to condense and give you the chromosomes. Lahaqan. Okay? And then as you go out again, over here you have what we call the nuclear envelope. Okay? Which is there? Nuclear envelope. So again, let's go back to the question. What is the nucleus? What is it made of? It's made up of a nucleolus, chromatin, that is going to convert into chromosomes, and a nuclear envelope. 
that's the nucleus. And if you want to zoom here, you'll see what are these things over here? Let's zoom and keep the sura. What do we have here? Remember, I told you about a core complex. This is the nuclear envelope, uh, nuclear uh, pores. They are small openings. They are openings in the nuclear envelope. Why? Why are they openings? Well, because we want the ribosomal subunits and the genetic material to go out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. فلازم يكون في فتحات لازم يكون في ثغرات في غلاف النواة يسمح بمرور المواد داخل وخارج النواة. Okay, so we have these nuclear pores. Okay, they call them pore complexes. They're made up of proteins. Uh, this is a pore complex. It's made up of proteins, and these are small, tiny openings that allow material to go past the cell in and outside the nucleus. The nuclear envelope, it's a double membrane, so it's uh, made up of two layers. Uh, it surrounds the genetic material. It has an outer layer and an inner layer. In between the outer and the inner layer, there is a space. Uh, each membrane is a lipid bilayer with associated proteins, and these are perforated by pores. Fatahat, they are pores. Each pore is lined by what we call a pore complex, which is a protein structure. So the pro pore looks like this. You have an opening. But then you have something that looks like this, looks like a flower. Okay, so this is an opening here that allows things to go in and out. And these here are proteins. Okay, so this whole thing is called pore complex. Okay, and the function, it allows some large molecules and particles to go past and through, as I explained in the previous slide. So as you can see over here, all right, so that's the nucleolus, that's a chromatin, and this is the nuclear envelope. And right now we're discussing the nuclear envelope. If we enlarge this part of the nuclear envelope, you can see it's made up of two layers, an inner layer and an outer layer. And then the space in between it. Okay, and you can see here that the nuclear uh, pore is found on the outer membrane of the nucleus. So this is just a close up of the nuclear envelope. So the inner side, and now we know what's on the outer side. The inner side of the envelope, except for the pores, is lined with what we call our nuclear lamina. So on the inside part, من الداخل, داخل نوع, في مثل lining. Okay, it's got a lining called nuclear lamina. What is that? It's a network of intermediate filaments that give the uh, nucleus the shape. All right, it gives the nucleus its structure. So it maintains the shape. Of the nucleus. So this is our nucleus. I'll try to use this in yellow. Maybe it'll be more clear. This is our nucleus, and here you have a double layer. If we are in to enlarge uh, this double layer, you'll see us put it here. One, two. This is the inside of the nucleus, and this is the outside of the nucleus, and this here is space. Okay. Now in the inside we have. Oh, like this. That's I'm not very good in drawing. But anyway, let's, this is the nuclear lamina, which is a about on fibers. It's a network of fibers uh, called intermediate filaments that gives the nucleus its shape. What's about the outside of the nucleus? What does it have? It has the ribosomes. Ribosomes on the outside of the nuclear envelope. We call them bound ribosomes. Next, so now we spoke about the envelope. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is a chromatin, this part over here. You see these lines inside here? This is all what we call the chromatin. Okay, what's a chromatin? It's a network of fibers, fibrous material. It's made of what? DNA and proteins. And the shabaka. Okay, it's a shabaka made of DNA and proteins. And what happens during the cell division, they actually coil and fold and condense to form the chromosome. So these lines that you see here, these fibers that are made up of genetic material and protein, during cell division, they're going to condense and squeeze and coil until they form the chromosomes. And the chromosomes we all know is the one that carries the genes. Each chromosome is made up of a very long DNA that, uh, and associated proteins that fold and fold and fold and fold to give you finally the chromosome. That's a fat chromosome there. Okay. So they condense and give you a chromosome.
Finally, we're going to go inside into the nucleus, uh, nucleolus. So we finished talking about the envelope. We finished talking about the chromatin. And now we're going to talk about this part here inside the nucleus. And Samiha nucleolus. Nuiya. Okay, now how I think you remember this from high school. All right. This is a region of densely stained fibers and granules adjoining chromatin. So it's very condensed fibers and chromatin. These are non-membranous structures. They don't have a membrane surrounding them. There's no membrane here in the nucleolus. It's literally two or more nuclei that can be found in some cells depending on uh, the species, depending on the site, st stage of cell division. Sometimes you have one or more nucleoli, nuclei depending on the activity of the cell. What's the function of the nucleo nucleolus? It's to synthesize R, RNA, and assemble them with proteins to give us what? Ribosomal subunits. So now we know where the ribosomal subunits are made. Okay, the subunits of the ribosome are made right there in the nucleus. Okay. This is a fun fact just for you to read. Nothing to memorize. It's just to make you smile. So actually the nucleus is the largest and most prominent organelle in the cell. It's the largest thing in the cell. And it's a very busy organelle, yeah? So you can see the nucleus over here. It's the largest one, largest organelle in the cell. The DNA can't leave the nucleus, okay? Um, we need to know, because we already know that which organelle makes the proteins. We, are, we agreed that the ribosomes is the organelle that makes protein. The DNA codes must be carried from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, and the RNA does the job. So what happens is the DNA doesn't leave its place. The DNA stays inside the nucleus. What goes in and out are the ribosomal subunits, and the RNA takes uh, care of that, that job. And now we're going to talk about the endoplasmic reticulum, which we call ER for short. So endo means inside, and plasmic comes from the word cytoplasm, and reticulum is the little net. So actually the name is telling you the function. The ER, what is it? It's a little network in the cytoplasm. And what does it do? Let's see. So it's a network of connected or continuous membranous tubes and sacs called cisternae. Okay, half the membranes in the eukaryotic cells are actually made up of ER. So if you look at all the membranes in the eukaryotic cell, 50% of it is the ER. Now let's look about how the cisternae issue will have the cisternae. Okay, um, there is a cisternal space, which is an internal compartment separated by the ER membrane from the cytosol, and I'll show you that in the picture in just a second. And the cisternal space, it also has another name called ER lumen, and it's mainly left shape. You can either call it cisternal space or you call it, call it ER lumen. What is it? It is, a continu it is continuous with the space between uh, the two membranes of the nuclear envelope. Okay, and I think I explained this better using the slide. All right, so this over here is the ER, endoplasmic reticulum. It is right outside the nuclear envelope, part of the nuclear envelope. Right? Right outside it, you see the ER. It's actually continuous. If we come and zoom this part over here, you will find that it's highlighted, okay? This part over here, it's actually connected physically to each other. The envelope, the nuclear envelope is physically connected to the ER. All right, we have two types of ER. We have no ER, smooth ER and rough ER, depending on what. If they are brown ribosomes attached to the ER, we call it rough. And if there are no ribosomes attached to the ER, we call it smooth, naam. Naam, khashan. Lish naam khashan, hasab wujud a ribosome. Ida kan multasak fi min kharajo ribosomat, ikun khashan, rough ER. See, ribosomes attached to its surface. And if there are no ribosomes attached to the surface, then it's nice and smooth, naam. Okay, so we have two types of ER. What are the functions of the smooth ER and the rough ER? Uh, the smooth ER is involved in the metabolic processes because it is rich in enzymes. It has so many enzymes. Okay, and um, what are the jobs? What are the jobs of the smooth ER? Secretion of steroids. Okay, and secretion of sex hormones. So then the smooth ER, 
um, that is rich, uh, that does not have ribosomes attached to its surface. It's involved in the secretion of steroids and it's also involved in the secretion of sex hormones. So it synthesizes the lipids, the oils, phospholipids, steroids, all of these. Where are they made? They are made in the smooth ER. Uh, the second job it does, so that was the first one, synthesis of lipids. The second thing it does, it pumps calcium ions from the cytosol to the cisternae. So for example, when a nerve impulse stimulates a muscle cell, the calcium will rush from the ER into the cytosol, triggering a contraction. So another job of the smooth ER is during muscle contraction, when they during muscle contraction, the nerve um, allows the calcium to rush going from the ER uh, into the cytosol that allow that contraction to happen. The smooth ER enzymes will pump then calcium back, um, back and uh, uh, allowing the cell to go, to get ready and prepared for the next muscle contraction. So basically you can think of it as, uh, it helps assist in the muscle contraction process. So during muscle contractions, we need uh, the smooth ER because it has enzymes that will allow and assist for muscle contraction by allowing the calcium to rush into the cytosol and help muscle contractions. That was the smooth ER. What about the rough ER? Um, these are very abundant in cells that secrete proteins uh, because proteins need ribosomes. So what are the job of the rough ER? One of them or the first one is to manufacture secretory proteins like glycoproteins. Okay, and the glycoproteins are polypeptides attached to small polymers of sugar units, oligosaccharides. You find them on the outer side, uh, surface of the cell, called glycoproteins. Um, and these are transported within the cell to trans uh, in the transport vesicles. So what happens, this is the ER here, okay, the rough ER. They produce glycoproteins, and these glycoproteins are normally found on the outer side of the cell. How do they go from the ER to the outer side of the ER? Uh, from, how do they go from the ER to the outer side of the cell? Through transport vesicles. So these glycoproteins, okay, they are produced here in the rough ER, and then they go through the vesicles, the Golgi body, they get processed, and then they leave and they go out to the uh, membrane, the plasma membrane. The second function of the rough ER is synthesis of membranes. So the rough uh, ER is responsible for synthesizing phospholipids. Uh, they are also responsible for the synthesis of membrane proteins. They are also responsible for the synthesis of the membrane. Yeah, the phospholipids and the proteins um, are under the um, yeah, any, uh, the job, one of the functions of the rough ER is to make phospholipids and proteins, and these can be transferred um, as transport vesicles to the other parts of the endomembrane system. So they are made in the ER, and then they are transported through vesicles to their final destination. And then in the rough ER, we have the first synthesis of, uh, of glycoproteins. Here is synthesis of membranes. When membranes is made up of phospholipids and proteins. And how does it go from inside the cell to the outside of the cell to the membrane? Through these transport vesicles, the transport vesicles. And we will stop here for cellular organelle one. I would like you to go back to the book and read uh, the associated pages. We spoke today about um, the introduction to uh, organelles. We spoke about the endomembrane system. And we said going from the inside to the outside, it's made up of the nucleus, the ER, vesicles, Golgi body, vacuoles, lysosomes, and the plasma membrane. Had a killer constituating the endomembrane system. And today we spoke about the nucleus, and we said it's made up of three parts, uh, the nuclear envelope, chromatin, and nucleus. And then we spoke about the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and we said there's two types, the rough and smooth, depending on the ribosomes. We also described the ribosome in more detail and the function of the ribosomes, and we said we have two types of ribosomes, free ribosomes and bound ribosomes. That was today's lecture. Please make sure that you fully understand it, uh, revise it, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us, uh, or please Google, because Google is the best friend for students, and it can give you very clear answers. Looking forward to seeing you with the next lecture, Cellular Organelles 2 with 3.2. Assalamu alaikum.